and then where is it gone from there? Okay, well, um, every story has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And this story, as uh, Rick was just uh, expressing to us, Ben Hogan had this, this very successful book called the Modern, the Modern Fundamentals, Five Lessons, and in it he discussed the grip, the posture, the stance, etc. Uh, five, the modern fundamentals in the five lessons. This one? Yes, sir. This is it. This, this is the Bible. <laughs> this is the Bible. I get, you can see this has been used a little bit. But in any case, uh, he talks about this theory of initiating his downswing with the rotating of the left hip. Yeah. And uh, it actually, because, because of the type of golfer that Ben Hogan was, he was a very serious hooker of the golf ball, had a very strong grip, and for him, it has, it has grown, this theory has grown to the point whereby the, it is pretty much uh, understood by all teachers that if you initiate the lower body, that you minimize the hand action into the hitting area. And so when, when players that are not athletic, i.e. cannot move their lower body quickly, swing with this initiating of the left hip, they tend to come over the top and cause a very serious slight. Well, Hogan was so right. you know, he was one of these, you know. That's right. Way over here. Deep, deep angle, Ooh. deep angle, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. That particular move doesn't work for me. Right. Which you know? brings us back to what we said earlier in this presentation, that everyone has to discover on their own what system works best for them. And I have to say, okay, as great a player as Ben Hogan was, and I have great respect for him and for his accomplishments, if Ben Hogan was such a great player, how come no one swings like him today? Yeah. So therefore, what that statement says is that they cannot, because he was a one type person, one uh, person, individual, wrist, body, right. and uh, in, in the most not duplicate. What do you think Hogan would do today if he was on tour? Well, I think Hogan's swing would have been different because his beginnings would have been different. And it's a very, I think, uh, a good history lesson to know the struggles that Ben Hogan had in his devastating uh, occurrence. His father committed suicide. Later in his life he had uh, many, many troubles, grew up very poor. And so in today's teaching, as we all know, there are numerous quality teachers available. And so a young person today should not grow up with the idiosyncrasies that Hogan had to overcome. You know, I think that um, part of the Hogan mystique, though, was formed and based on his personal upbringing, you know. upbringing, right. Yeah. No question about it. Yeah. This is a person that had so much put in front of him that he had to, he had no choice. He had no choice but to continue to struggle and to overcome the shortcomings that, that were placed obstacles that were placed in this path. So can the Hogan can the methodology survive today? Well, to say no, because it's, a, it's such a difficult way to transfer energy from the club to the ball that it, it just requires supreme timing and agility to perform this task. We've, we've got the golf swing now where it's very, very simple, we think. But, uh, yeah, that, that, ladies and gentlemen, is as simple a golf swing as you can possibly imagine. It's basically just an up and down movement. He understands where the club is all through his swing, which Hogan, he did not. He had to manipulate the club laid off in the back swing so that he could come into the hitting area and to, to, uh, block, if you will, his yeah, flipping action yeah. is very, very complicated. I would not recommend it. 
uh, to anyone. And to answer your question directly, I do not think that anyone, which is pretty much proven, no one swings like Hogan did. Yeah, well, probably, and that's one of the reasons why he had to practice Absolutely. the way he did. It required supreme timing. Yeah. It's a definite, it's well known throughout the teaching business and in golf, any player will tell you this is a game of timing. If you have perfect timing, which we will explain about people like Lee Trevino, Alan Doyle, uh, Miller Barber, if you have supreme timing and athleticism, then you can perform miracles. But the average person has no chance of accomplishing that timing. Ready? You know, after Hogan, there was a big move into the 70s with Jack Nicholas. Arnold Palmer. You know, Arnold Palmer, the big muscles. That's right. Hit uh, it hard. Yeah, hit it hard. Uh, big hip turn, big shoulder turn. Uh, how did golf move, in your opinion, from Hogan, Snead, okay. Nelson into okay. uh, Watson and Nicholas? The, the way it progressed was there was a teacher by the name of Jack Grout who, believe it or not, was a very good friend with one of Hogan's best friends, Byron Nelson. Yeah. And Jack Grout learned and, if you will, perfected a method whereby what we call the large muscles, i.e. your upper your arms, your lower body, was a dominant force as opposed to the little muscles, i.e. your wrists and yeah, your arms. Yeah, yeah. And when he, when he uh, taught Jack Nicholas and other players followed, of course, because of Jack Nicholas's great success, that when they started to learn the big muscle swing, then it overtook all of the prior theories mm -hmm. altogether. Palmer, of course, being a, uh, an absolute magician. One of the things I must say is that Arnold Palmer, I had the pleasure of seeing him play on, I'm a Pennsylvania boy, so I've played at Oakmont myself, had the pleasure of playing on Penn State's golf team through the late, uh, late uh, 70s. And uh, I saw Arnold Palmer on many occasions play in amateur tournaments. And he was a magnificent putter. Most people do not acknowledge that, you know, obviously Palmer with his charisma yeah. and his power, of course, his very uh, physical physique. Well, you know, oh, he hits the ball miles. Well, yes, he hit the ball well. Not, not that much better than everybody else. But when it came to putting and the short game, he was an absolute magician. Mm. And he's one of these people with his marriage with television, you know, his timing, if you will, was just perfect for the game of golf. And we all, as golf professionals, owe a great debt of gratitude to a person of Arnold Palmer. But Nicholas had the, the first in the, the grout Nicholas theory was the connection here, the uh, arm. Well, actually, connection. actually, that is true. But actually, the big thing that, that grout taught Nicholas was reach for the sky, which led to a flying right elbow. His hands were extremely high and wide. And also Jack Nicholas, as opposed to today's golf swing, got very high up on his left toe. That's right. So, so his whole body, if you will, moved off the ground, very high on his left toe, a huge pivot. And that, of course, contributed to his tremendous power. And the width of his swing, in comparison to what we've been teaching uh, Rick here, very similar. Nicholas had an, a slight outside takeaway which allowed him to have a very wide arc. That's right, reach for the sky. That's the Jack Grout theory. Elbow flying away from the body, sh right shoulder very high. Yeah, away. That's correct. And uh, no, no uh, concern for the wildness. Now, a lot of people don't know that when Jack Nicholas first came on tour, he was somewhat of a wild ball striker, mm -hmm. but extremely long. A lot of people don't know this. Here's a piece of trivia. Jack Nicholas went to Ohio State on a basketball scholarship. Hmm. Now that is, if you will, proves or validates his athletic ability. Great athlete. Tremendous athlete right, right. in other sports as well as basketball. Was also a great football player, a baseball player. You know, just one of these all-around athletes and happened to gravitate toward golf. And the rest is history, you know. You think the uh, grout Nicholas method can can work today? Is it still valid today? Well, again, I have to say no. The progression of teaching 
and of the simplicity of the golf swing, Jack Nicklaus's swing also has been criticized because of the moving parts. Mm. The right elbow flying away from the body, yes, it allows for a huge arc and a lot of power. However, you've got to make a real effort to get mm. that right elbow back in a down position to get the club square to the ball. And again, Nicholas's success, you know, I mean, no question, his major record is unquestioned. But again, a lot of his success was due more to his length than his, if you will, accuracy. And again, another fantastic putter. I mean, one person that'll tell you that, well, two that come to mind immediately are Doug Sanders, one of the straightest ball hitters ever, but nowhere close to Nicholas in length, and Lee Trevino, who has uh, had a very close relationship with Jack Nicholas. And again, we as professionals have a great debt to the game that uh, Jack Nicholas has created. You know, from Nicholas, it sort of went into uh, Jimmy Ballard. You remember Ballard? Yes, sir. You know, which was the rock and slide. And right. Of course that, well, that Jimmy was... Ballard uh, has always been a favorite of mine. Uh, however, he really gained fame when he had the success of Curtis Strange as a two-time U.S. Open champion. But the truth is, Curtis Strange learned from another teacher that was magnificent, a, a Hall of Fame golfer by the name of Chandler Harper and uh, I would like to get into that a little bit later but Curtis was a fantastic player all through high school uh, NCAA champion uh, unfortunately did not win the US Amateur but was a great champion and a very strong thinker of the, the game but, but back, Jim, Jimmy Ballard's method the rock and slide the again, connection the right connection of the rock and slide right uh, again, questionable as to whether this swing should be very consistent. Uh, Rick will demonstrate now. Yes, a, a, a very, very, yes, very, very pronounced sway into the backswing. But actually, the head was not swaying. It was moving backwards, which is to load up into the right side. And Curtis, of course, being as athletic as he was, was able to recreate the head position. Right, right. And uh, most people cannot do that. They move back and then they hit off their right foot. And that's, that's the disaster. One of the things also that that swing creates is a very high ball flight and very short. Well, it takes, um, it takes a lot of timing to perfect that thing because you're moving off, adding back into it, and that is, rock and slide type of thing. That is correct. Yeah, that so you wouldn't correct. recommend it. Well, no one, no one does. I, I can't recommend any method because I'm a teacher, as, as has been already described in this presentation, that every person's swing is their own. Yeah. And, uh, you, and, and you will learn when you, when you get into this more that when you own a swing, when you commit to your golf swing, you will have success beyond your greatest dreams. You know, the word own the swing, we all know who that is. And of course, that's Mo Norman. That's right. And if you, well, right. the people watching this, the level one player within level three, you know who Mo Norman is, owned his swing. And of course, Tiger said, Absolutely. not only he, Ben Hogan, well, I guess it was Norm, Mo Norman and Ben Hogan owned their swing and Tiger wanted to own his swing. <laughs> That's right. He didn't even own his own swing. That's right. Well, Tiger, Tiger has had, uh, through numerous teachers, uh, some of the most prominent being Butch Harmon and, uh, of course, Hank Haney at the present time, Tiger has had a stable, a complete, uh, uh, if you will, A through Z of top teachers. What, what a lot of people don't know about Tiger is his caddy for the longest time when he was an amateur was a psychiatrist. He understood exactly what Tiger was going through when he was a young man and encouraged him without any negativity that you are, you're suffering now, if you will, you're experiencing this, you're going to learn, you're going to improve, and it was, it was a fantastic, and I'll share with you at this time, Tiger's greatest teacher and tool was a man by the name of Earl Woods, and he will tell you that himself. I've had the privilege of talking to Tiger on some occasions, I won't go into it too much, but without his father, he never could have been the player that we know today. You know, from Ballard, then we get into Ledbetter, and I can tell you, 
from personal experience. Uh, that particular method didn't work for me. Now, obviously, it worked for Faldo, and it worked for Nick Price. Uh, Dennis, however, Dennis yeah, Watson, yeah, say Dennis Watson, Watson, sure. Uh, it didn't work for me because of the fact that I felt I was more of a feel player, whereas that method to me felt a lot very Mecha mechanical uh, right. to me. You know. Okay, Mr. Ledbetter has been, if you will, the dean of the teaching profession, and <clears throat> uh, golf, as we teach it, is a four-letter word, and the four letters are F E E L. Don't tell me what it looks like said the great Bill Strasbaugh. Okay, Bill Strasbaugh is one of the most prominent teachers in the PGA. But in any case, uh, don't tell me, Bill said, don't tell me what it looks like, tell me what it feels like. So therefore, based on what you just said, since you could not relate to the feel that Mr. Ledbetter was trying to transfer to you, it was very difficult for you. Yeah. But again, Mr. Ledbetter, without question, one of the top teachers that the game has ever known. Yeah, I, I just think, um, you know, it it's wrong. Right, it, not, it doesn't mean it's wrong, doesn't mean Hogan's method is wrong. Exactly. It just didn't work for me. Right. And so each player which, has to figure out. Which is exactly what we have been saying all yeah. through this video. If you want to attain the level that you're seeking, i.e. to become a tour player, yes, you have to have knowledge, you have to know the whys of what's causing your swing to do, this and that. Once you learn that, then you must build your own swing. If you will, you have to build your own car. You cannot buy the Corvette that costs $100,000 and take it to Daytona. You've got no chance. Think about what I'm saying. These people have the best crew chiefs, the best cars, the best engines in the world. They don't make that, that car for the street. Mm. So that's exactly what we're saying to you regarding your golf swing. Once you learn the fundamentals of your golf swing, what your tendencies are, grip-wise, stance-wise, tempo-wise, all of these factors, you must build your own car. You must build your own swing. Yeah. That's what I'm sharing with you and today. And have somebody who's knowledgeable and can relate to you as a crew chief. And that's, that's to, right. The handle here. And the reason okay. for that is, even though you think you're doing a certain thing, you may not be doing it. You cannot see yourself. Yeah. So you need, uh, I heartily uh, tell everyone out there to have their own team in terms of not only a teacher, yeah. but I mean, your greatest asset, I, and uh, I, I say this to every tour player, is your wife. There's no question without her on your team, meaning to encourage you, to understand you, to raise your family, you will not, the chances of having success are very slim. Yeah. So when you've got uh, a lady in your life and the Lord, which I believe in very strongly, and, and as I, I will describe later, many other top tour players do also. When you've got those things in place, you're way ahead of the curve. I way. guess the, the newest fad out there now um, is this thing called the stack and tilt. Yes, and you've sir. seen it, I, I've discussed it with you before, and actually I've made a version of the stack and tilt that has worked for me. And the reason it worked for me is because I used to rock off the ball yes, sir. and hit the ball thin. Right. That was my big deal was right. hitting the ball thin. Big problem. And the stack and tilt has helped me stay more centered over the ball. I mean, I think that the stack and tilt is just the golf machine being uh, regurgitated in some way. Perfected, yes. yes. Uh, it's Improved. very difficult for people to understand that the golf machine has ruined uh, you know, a lot of good players. However, the theory of stack and tilt is just a simple turning and having the left shoulder not moving off the ball, yes. just turning and having the right shoulder go higher makes you come down the ball steeper. Right. You ain't got to worry about head motion or staying down the ball. Right, you know? right. Stack and tilt is a very successful method, without question. The, uh, it's, I, I feel it's easy to understand, which is a major, major uh, success of the, the... Rick has a theory whereby he says his he feels like he's staying on top of the ball. Yeah, right it's something here. that we teach uh, quite regularly because people tend to slide in front of the ball or hit what into what's called a reverse C. A reverse C is where you're hanging on your right foot and the slide forward is, is just as deadly. But the stack and tilt, when you get on top of the ball and stay there, 
then, then, then that you have something that you can work on. Again, any method, we've said this, Jim Furyk and, and many others, any method will work. You just need to work it. But again, the stack and tilt is he turns away from it, and there you go. There you go. Yeah. Ball position is also not as much a factor in stack and tilt because you have a tendency to cover the ball. Yeah. You don't have to worry about catching up with the ball. Yeah. Well, the thing that's worked for me for stack and tilt was that I don't have to think about staying down. I'm already on top of the ball. Well, see, now, th know. we've discussed this with your swing. Your swing tended to be too flat, right, too right, inside. Right. Once you learned how to take the club up, yeah. you, you pretty much solved your own problem. Yeah, so right. stack and tilt is uh, definitely a message, yeah. a successful method for you. So in summary, I guess you can say you like you like you said, Marty. Identify. You've got to find your own way. Build it. Take a little bit from Hogan. Take a little bit from Sack and Tilt. Take a little bit from Ballard. Well, build your own swing. That's right. Well, really, that's that, that's a little that's a little difficult. What you're saying. You don't take a little bit from it. You learn what you're doing. That is, if you will, not Hogan. Mm. And from learning from that, then you can build your own. Right. Because my tendency is to, you know, get a little over it, uh, tilt under it, get a little too handsy, mm -hmm. you know, all of these different things. But you don't want to, you don't want to incorporate like seven different methods. Mm -hmm. Let's not say that. Mm -hmm. But what you want to do is you want to acknowledge through time-tested tournaments, okay, let's uh, in, make that point, uh, hitting the ball on the range, like you say, driving range pros are dime a dozen. Dime a dozen. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to raise your game to level three, which by the way is, this is m must reading for, for you aspiring players. And I don't say that because it has anything to do with Rick or myself. You will understand what level three is. Once you understand that, then you can proceed to develop yourself along those lines. If you cannot perform on a national level, you don't even want to go out there with Tiger Woods. And I'll relate a little story to you. My father was a semi-pro tennis player. When I played tennis with him when I was like 10 years old, I never wanted to play tennis with him again because he ran me around that court like I was some kind of a yo-yo. This is exactly what would happen to you if you go out there and play with Tiger Woods. He'll run you around in circles out there. And he will just absolutely devastate you. So you need to gr uh, go gradually, step by step, week by week, tournament by tournament, to get to a place where you feel comfortable to compete with somebody of that level. And you've got to earn it. There is no gift in golf. Nobody can buy a golf club and now become a scratch handicap. Mm. Okay? No golf ball is going to hit the ball 300 yards. There's no such thing. You've got to graduate through hard work, good teaching, good equipment, good theories, just plain hard work to get to where you want to go. And we all know a, a player of this level can hit any club, any ball. It does not matter whatsoever. You all know that. Club has very little to do with it, you know. Uh, I agree so, with that. I agree with that. And, and, and at your level, you're going to get free clubs and free balls anyway. So just like Marty said, use the best equipment you can and go from there. Brief well, mention of this first book I made and written, and here it's called how to win the U.S. Open, but level three simply means you are a level three player. You are an expert single digit or plus digit handicap player. You want to go deeper down